What's going on, everybody? This is Patreon. I even wrote it down this time. It's episode 93 of Patreon, as a matter of fact. Let's see, I have my uh, very detailed notes as to what episode it is. I had to look real hard because I almost didn't see that. That's because you're drunk. You're right. No. It's, it's true. Possibly. Um, um, not really. So, this week, I found a badass. And it was like, not really an- enough to do a full episode... Okay. We'll throw my Patreon. See okay. how see how it goes. You know. Oh, and by the way, for all you fuckers that were harassing me about how I sounded, yeah, I saw that. Don't oh yeah. I didn't. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. D- David said you looked like uh, you sounded like fucking Jim Carrey's uh, <laughs> transgender weightlifter from In Living Color, and yeah. he was absolutely right. You did. Whatever. You know, it happens. I had to go back and watch the clip because I haven't seen that show in so long, and I was like, wait a minute, he does sound like that. Yeah. Yeah. It was pretty good. Yeah. Good impression. Yeah, sort of. Okay. Anyway, well, that was just because I had didn't have a voice, so fuck you all. <laughs> it was only him. <laughs> like, he was the only one that gave you shit for it. Oh, there was others I know that guaranteed. No, it was just him. He was the only one that was vocal about it, at Well, least. if it had been on a regular, regular episode, everybody else would have been. Well, you, we that recorded was, a regular episode. It was, too. Matter of yeah. fact, we recorded two regular episodes true. and a Patreon, and you sounded like it's true. you got throat-fucked by Satan in all three of them. So. I, true. True. I um, probably did. Strong possibility. Man, possibly. Never know. Hard telling. But anyway, so badass. Yeah. Yeah, this is, this is a different one for us, because it's not... It's from World War II, but it's some... some it's a part of the war that we don't really talk about that much. And the guy is of a nationality that I don't know that we've ever talked about during a badass episode. Okay. Take a wild guess. His name is Spiro Ma- Malakis. I'm going to say Greek. Yeah, nailed it. Fucking wow. Spiro. That's kind of like, you know. No, it was definitely the Malakis part. Okay. Um, <laughs> so he was born September 19th, 1912. Um, his parents are Apollo and Maria. See, um, if you had just said his father's first name, I would have been like, ah, instantly. Yeah. Uh, he was born in uh, Kalamata, Greece. Uh, he, this dude came out with uh, just so much arm hair, like forearm hair already. Oh, Jesus he Christ. He looked like his a poor... fucking werewolf being, like, hatched out. His poor mother probably had fucking heartburn, like, Dude, she, she had... Or she had... Yeah, I mean... She had a lot of armpit hair, too. I was going to say something else, but... <laughs> she probably had that, too. She had a fur Full. diaper. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's the early 1900s. They're Greek. Yeah. These people look like fucking Bigfoot. <laughs> I mean, eh, probably where Bigfoot came from. <laughs> his, his mother had a, had a Stalin mustache. Uh, That's just because she hadn't waxed it in six hours. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mom and dad live a pretty simple life. They ran a family bakery. Um, they opened it in 1913, uh, but they didn't open it in Greece. They had moved to Alezzo, uh, Italy. Opened the bakery there. You know, it's it's that same... It's that wet, the eastern half, uh, eastern coast of of Italy, so you have a lot of similarities there between Greece and you know it's just that it's the Mediterranean yeah, area, there, yeah. you know. Okay. Everything smells like fucking tzatziki, and I'm down for it. Hey. Um, not a not a great time to open the bakery, um, nor good location either, uh, considering they are the next city inland from Gallipoli. Oh. Um. Yeah. It was. You know, when he was three years old, uh, World War Two, uh, World War One had already started, mm-hmm. and the Battle of Gallipoli kicked off February nineteenth, nineteen fifteen. Um, I did a little bit of background, like kind of like vagued out the whole thing because I didn't want to go into full detail on it. Fighting started when the Brits and French launched an attach, uh, an attach, attach, huh? An attack on the uh, Dardanelles Strait. The tail end of February, beginning of March, nineteen fifteen. Um, continued with a pretty good sized land invasion of, of the Gallipoli uh, Peninsula on April 25th, which involved British and French troops. Um, they also brought with them what was referred to as the Anzac, which are Australia, New Zealand Armor, uh, Army Corps. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So they, they brought the scary fucking people with them too, you know, because like, yeah, the Brits, yeah, they were, they were pretty good in world war one. The French, not bad in world war one. Anytime you throw Australians and Kiwis into a war, you're going to have a bad fucking time. True. Um, because they are criminals and Maori, respectively. <laughs> Criminal Maori. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've seen their, their rugby teams and fucking no thank you. I would want a gun going against either one of them. 
Mm. Fuck, I wouldn't I wouldn't fight anybody on the New Zealand women's rugby team. Ooh. They'd fucking kill you. Probably. Like thighs yeah. the size of my chest. Like they're thick women. They're warrior they're warrior groups. They, they again, they will kill you. They I mean, they There's a lot of rowing. Well, the, rowing's not a a, a a leg thing, but uh yeah, so you okay, know, fine. They're they're tough, dude. I'll give them that. Um so they didn't have a good amount of intelligence as to what was really going on with like the terrain and stuff like that. Um, and they also underestimated the Turks that were already there holding the area. They kind of thought that, oh, we'll, we'll go in and we'll, we'll kick these guys asses, blah, blah, blah. Not the case. The Turks fought like goddamn dogs in Gallipoli. They were, they were tough. Um, by mid October allied forces had suffered heavy casualties, um, that it, they'd made very, very little headway from where they initially landed on the beaches. I mean, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, I'm, I, I could be wrong, but I'm, I'm pretty sure like the Turks were so strong because they had been fighting different wars on and off for quite a well, while. Dude, the fucking Turks have been at war with everybody since they were the Ottomans. Yeah. And it wasn't until like World War One ended where, you know, eventually they got their asses handed to them, but they also had a mm. genocide they had to do. So they were busy with that, too. True. Which I mean, nobody talks about because, you know, fucking Armenians, whatever. Nobody's ever heard of them. Don't worry about them. You know, system of, down, of a down. They're not Armenian or anything. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, that's one that definitely doesn't get the uh, the amount of attention it probably should because uh, it was bad. Yeah. It was really fucking bad. <laughs> uh, we talked about it in our Asshole Eliminator episode with... Uh, Ah, uh, shit. The guy you covered, the Pasha there. That ended up getting executed in the fucking streets like a... Yeah, yeah, Like a yeah. dog in Germany somewhere, yeah. 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 Yeah, they sucked, dude. Um, so after the, the failed naval attack, perception... I'm sorry. Per, uh, yes. Preparation began for a large-scale troop landing on the Gallip- uh, Gallipoli Peninsula. Um British War Secretary Lord Kitchener uh, approved General Ian Hamilton as uh, commander of British uh, British forces for the operation. Um, Under his command, the troops of Australia, New Zealand, and the French colonies would all assemble with British forces on the Greek island of Lemnos. Uh, April 25th, 1915, the Allies launched their invasion of the Gallipoli Peninsula. Despite heavy, heavy casualties again, they managed to establish a couple of a couple of beachheads. Um... And they could kind of fight from here. Uh, it didn't still. You're still fighting a superior force with better positioning. And yeah, it's not going to be a good time. No. After the initial landing, the Allies were able to make little progress from their initial landing sites. I already read that. Um, even as the Turks gathered more and more troops on the peninsula from both. Um, they were getting they were pulling guys from the Caucasus front where they were fighting the Russians. Um, and they were also pulling people from Israel. Not Israel, Palestine. I'm sorry, where they were fighting the Brits there as well. So it's it's part of World War One that doesn't really get talked about because it was not a good time for the good guys. No, you know we had fucking Lawrence of Arabia out here just being white as fuck on a horse, you know. And um, hey, I mean he he did he all got right, it done. I guess. He did all right, but he got it fucking done. He did. He done did it. That was actually a lot of people consider <coughs> that section of the war the first war that we ever fought over oil because that's when it was becoming a big thing to have because this is like the first mechanized war that we fought as a species for the most part on a large scale we had you got to feed trucks you got to feed planes you got to feed tanks in some cases you know they don't run on lollipops and puppy farts true you know and that's i mean we had our own oil we had enough here to right. cover what we needed but we weren't involved at this point this is 1915 we were still a couple of years out from committing war crimes with shotguns true which i still think is hilarious that the germans got all butt hurt about guys with shotguns but they were gassing people and that was okay it's like eh, eh. would you rather get gassed and drown in your own fluids or get your teeth brushed with double lot buckshot and just have it not be an issue anymore. See, I don't know. I mean, 
Okay, I'll take the b- double out buckshot. Yeah, I mean, dude, those fucking Winchesters they were going over there with were... Those are hurt sticks. That didn't... No. Nobody was having a good time on the wrong end of those. No. You know, fucking five or seven round whatever pump action shotguns. We weren't playing around. Um, okay. So in an attempt to break through the stalemate, the Allies made another major troop landing on August 6th in Sulva Bay. Um, they combined with uh, the northward advance from the Anzac Cove towards the height of Sorry, Sorry Bear. Bar, B-R, uh, whatever the fuck it is. Um, so these landings took the Turks by surprise, which gave the Allies a little bit of an advantage, but not enough to really, not enough to really do anything. Mm. With Allied casualties in the Gallipoli campaign mounting, Hamilton, who had the support of a uh, guy that was not, he wasn't a huge hit during World War One, but World War Two, he, he dropped his second album in World War Two and, that shit was a banger. Like, everybody loved that. Yeah. Winston Churchill. Ah. Uh, yeah. True. Um, he almost lost. It. Actually, he did lose his job during World War One. He did. He did. And then he's like, listen. Yeah. I went back to the lab. I I, re- I remixed my shit, and I think I got it this time. They, they were like, like, they were like, hey, call him the lefty. Okay. Like, wait a minute. Let, let's let's hear a mixtape. And he just walks over and breathes in their face. They're like, you smell like whiskey. I think you're in. You know, whiskey and cigars. We'll, we'll take yep. it. Um so Kitchener petitioned for 95,000 reinforcements. Um, the war secretary offered barely a quarter of that number. So they didn't get remotely the amount of guys that they needed for this. Uh, mid-October, Hamilton argued that a, a proposed evacuation of the peninsula, peninsula would cost up to 50% casualties. So you're going to lose half of your men here trying to get off of the fucking, off the peninsula. That's not good. No. That's not good at all. No. But consider, if you stay there, you're probably looking at closer to 70 to 80% casualties. So... Weigh your, weigh your uh, options and yeah. lesser two evils. Yeah. I mean, do you leave a bunch of teenagers there to die over somebody that they've never met before, never heard of before? Or do you try to get as many of them home as you can? Yeah. You know? World War One had the stupidest fucking start of any of the wars. I'm sorry. True. I am sorry. That is just... That's... It, it's retarded. Like... Some asshole gets shot and then, you know, 300 million teenagers go die in Europe for no fucking reason over this one asshole and his wife, who is probably also an asshole by, I would assume, by association. And it's all about, you know, that whole like, that whole, uh, <clears throat> well, we're allies with you and you're allies with them yeah, and yeah, then yeah. this and that. And, well, if we don't show good faith, then... Well, here's the thing. Guess who didn't fight in World War One? The Black Hand that started the whole fucking thing. <laughs> you know? So, eh. Hey. It's like the shit going on in the Middle East right now. It's like, uh, the Palestinians <laughs> didn't start that. Hamas started that. Yeah. <laughs> Are they Palestinians? Yeah. But... They're also a fucking terrorist organization that is noticed as a terrorist organi- organization by just about every government on the face of the earth. But who's paying the price ultimately? Everybody. Yeah. Civilians on both sides, as a matter of fact. But more so the Palestinians because the Palestinians yeah. are getting fucking bombed. Because the they're fuck. caught in the middle because Hamas is hiding behind them like fucking pussies. There's been a, there's been some footage come out where uh, Hamas has, has fired off rockets that are supposed to be going into Israel and they're coming up short and landing directly in the fucking Gaza strip and killing people. And they're like, Oh no, the Israelis bombed us again. They're like, we, yeah, we kind of saw that on satellite where it came up and then it came back down about 600 you, yards you, away. You're talking about the, you the, know, the, 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 the uh, hospital. Yeah. I, Oh no, no, no. It's happened more than once. Oh, it's happened more than once. Oh. Uh, there was a, Oh, I don't remember. It was like a market or some shit. They got <clears throat> they got blown to fuck by rockets, and they they showed the uh, the satellite footage of the rocket coming up. Like you see the arc, and then it comes almost almost straight back down. Well, so it thing, landed like <clears throat> the thing is a is, quarter mile away because it's it's a fucking RPG. No, this was not. This was not an RPG. It was a fucking like a land to land missile. Oh, well, because most of the ones I've seen are RPGs, and RPGs are fucking like, it's kind of like, you know, it's like, 
you're you're playing fucking you know you're playing uh i don't know i can't think of it cowboys and indians you know and one side's got the fucking bows and arrows and one side's got the fucking you know rifles and rpgs are more accurate than you give them credit for though yo know, yeah but they're not as accurate as a fucking as a goddamn uh jet flying over and going foo, foo. no definitely Lost not a fucking you know I mean, definitely not I mean, Hamas doesn't have all that. It's not like everybody, it's kind of like made out to be like, oh, well, we're going to do all this. And it, but it's like there's a huge genocide happening. And and us, we're going, you know what? Listen, we're going to send. I don't know. What is it like something like four point two billion or some shit like some stupid fucking number over there to help them out. I mean, come on. What, what I don't like is uh. the fact that we have a government that's trying to disarm our citizens, but they're also sending rifles to Israel to give to citizens to fight. Mm. Don't like the feel of that. They don't need them. They have no. a fucking best military but in you, the you, area. You understand what I'm saying, though, right? <clears throat> We're, we can't have them here, but it's okay for you to send them to civilians there because they can have them. Yeah. It's like, do we need to have a civil war just so we can keep our guns? Like, But, I mean, like I said, they don't. You know? They don't. They, it's It's... Cowboys and Indians, and one side's going to fucking lose, and it's going to be the Palestinians because, well, they're already losing. Yeah, and guess who's also not helping them? Any of the other fucking Muslim countries in the area. Because you know why? They're the bastard children. Because the Palestinians are being used as pawns by everybody else that could be helping them. They're the bastard children of the, the Muslim nation. Yeah. Nobody wants them. That's why they ended up in that area... And we're like, hey, okay, well, we'll take this. Nobody's going to fuck with us. And then all of a sudden, well, there's shit got taken. My, my favorite thing that I've seen recently, though, is a uh, fucking dickhead there in Ukraine. Zelensky is upset that this is happening. Not because there's, you know, civilians are being killed and this, that, the other. He's upset that this is happening because now we're not sending him as much money as we were before. Yeah. Oh, 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 I play you a fiddle, you fucking asshole. Get out there and fight yourself, you pussy, if you want to keep it going. Jesus Christ. You really need another fucking $600 billion from us, you prick? It doesn't cost that much. You guys are using fucking Walmart drones. The fuck out of here. I've been fighting for a fucking year, and you can't do shit. So, you know, we should probably stop giving you money. Yeah. You know. Anyway... Enough about those assholes. Let's talk about these assholes. Um, Let's talk about different assholes. Yeah. By early November, uh, Kitchener visited the region himself and agreed um, that Monroe, who was the uh, another general that was there, his recommend, uh, recommendation uh, that the remaining 105,000 Allied troops should be evacuated. He was like, yeah, we should probably fucking skedaddle and get out of here. Yeah. The British government authorized the evacuation from Gallipoli and began at Sulva Bay on December 7th. Um, the evacuation started December 7th mm -hmm. of 1915. Mm -hmm. The last Allied troop boarded a ship in uh, in Halaise January 9th of 1916. Took over a month to get everybody out of there. Oh, wow. I wonder how many they lost in that month. That's that's bad. Like, fucking Gallipoli was not a good place for no. anybody. Kind of like... You were um... Oh, uh, fuck. Dunkirk. Oh. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Dunkirk. That's what I was thinking. I was thinking Dunkirk. Yeah, except this one smells more like olive oil and you have nicer weather. <laughs> True. You know? Um, in all, 480,000 plus Allied forces took part in the Battle of Gallipoli um, at the cost of more than 250,000 casualties, including 46,000 plus killed outright. That's a lot. Uh, on the Turkish side... Um, they have another estimated 250,000 casualties with about 65,000 killed. So, yeah, they, the, the Allies killed more of them, but they still fucking lost. Yeah. So with all that going on, during the evacuation of the Gallipoli Peninsula, because they started evacuating civilians earlier than that, Spiro's father was killed by a car. Oh. The vehicle swerved. <laughs> <laughs> Holy fuck, like... The vehicle swerves to miss an oncoming military vehicle and hit him head on. Oh. They're on foot. Oh. Yeah, they don't have cars. Um, he died within feet of his son and his wife. Um, Maria was swept up in the relocation. Didn't really have time to 
they, they never had time to mourn or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, you yeah. know, they couldn't bury him. They're just like, fucking, I guess we got to go. Yeah. Um, so they're... Re- uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> Fuck. <clears throat> Ugh. Sorry. So they are uh, relocated to Corfu, which is another smaller island off of Greece. Yeah, okay. Um, I've heard of that one. You want to know why you've heard of that one? No. Because that's where Rogue Team International is, motherfucker. Oh. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Pick up a goddamn Joe Ledger book, everybody. Like, start at Patient Zero and read all of them. Yes. There's only 15 of them. You know, don't even, don't, don't even fucking read them. Don't be a bitch going audible. Yeah. Listen to Ray Porter read him to you. He is fucking, right. fucking magnificent. He is oh. a man. I'm telling you, if you have an audible credit and you want a good, like, military sci-fi, st- like, storyline, oh, yeah. 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 And then you want to... Get, then... get, get through Patient Zero. That one, that one's good, but it's not the best of them. Oh, boy. They just keep getting better from there. God damn. It's not the worst. It's not the worst. It's, I'm just saying it's... it's it's the it's definitely the first book in the series, you know. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. They get better from there. Oh yeah. Um, and don't get attached to characters because uh-uh. Jonathan Mayberry will break your fucking heart. He will, <laughs> for sure. He's like George R. R. Martin, but not as bad. I'm still I'm I'm still attached to one character, I mean, even though he's really technically not a character per se. But you know, I know that in- inevitable is going to happen when he's going to pass on or get killed. <sighs> Which one? The pupper. I don't think so. I don't think Jonathan Mayberry is a dog guy. The, the dog the ghost will retire. He will not die. I'm saying he'll pass yeah. on. But, you know, it, it won't be like in <coughs> fucking he, combat. It won't be somebody will, standing over him, shooting him in the head he, or something. He will have a Viking funeral. He'll be like, okay. no, he, he's he's an old fuck now. And we have another litter of them. So, yeah, you know, more badass. One yeah. coming along Rest your bones. Kind, sir. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they stay. They stay in Corfu until after the war. Um, and within a couple years, kind of spotty as to how long it was, uh, Maria remarried an Italian man by the name of Alfonso, who had actually been wounded in the battle of Gallipoli. <laughs> so he was one of the guys that was there fighting and, you know, no. uh, because I don't know if Italy was really involved. I think it was more of like a volunteer kind of thing. Like you're in my country, motherfucker, I'm going to fight yeah. kind of thing. Um, so they then moved with, uh, they, blah, 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 blah. The pair then moved with Spiro. Um, he was about 10 years old, and they settled on the Isle of Crete. Okay. Another little little island in Greece. Yep. Um, was Crete the one where the fucking Minotaur supposedly? Yes. I think the labyrinth, yeah. I think, yes, I believe yeah, so. Yeah, sounds about right. Um, if not, some something happened there, and uh, dudes have been butt-fucked in mythology on Crete. I'm 100% sure of that. Yeah. Voluntarily. Uh, or involuntarily. Know. Yeah. Yeah. Greek's pretty gay, not going to lie. Um, which leads me to, like, we need to do the Sacred Band of Thebes, because you want to talk about, like, like these guys are, like, capital letters, gay. Yeah. Capital letters, gay. Yeah, because you, you, you fought with your partner. <laughs> okay. You, you went to war, and you brought your partner with you, and that made you fight harder. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, there was only a couple hundred of them, but yeah, they they fought like goddamn monsters. Because like, uh, you ain't killing my husband, motherfucker. <laughs> uh, um. Anyway, so uh, Alfonso and Maria ended up. Uh, they opened another bakery since you know. You son of a bitch! <laughs> How dare you, cocksucker! Slash. Um, Slap. Uh. So. Obviously, Maria had experience with bakeries because, you know, her family, her, her, she comes from a long line of people owning bakeries. Her and her first husband had a bakery. Alfonso's mother ran a bakery. They're bakers. This is what they're going to do. I'm sorry. I just can't leave it alone. What? Only, only started going in the him is me. My meat sword. <laughs> going to sheath it. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, sorry. I couldn't let it go. So... <laughs> So when Spiro was 12, so a couple years later, um, his mother and stepfather had another son, and they were trying to come up with a name, and he goes, name him Apollo. And uh, surprisingly, Alfonso's like, yeah, let's do it. You know, he's like, it was, you know, it's your father's name. Um, and he kind of knew that had he not died, he probably never would have met Maria in the first place. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he's like, yeah, fuck it. Let's, let's do it. Um, Spiro and Alfonso actually had a really good bond because... Yeah, he was his stepfather, but he was his dad because he was so young when his father actually died that, you know, he didn't have the 
Yeah, yeah. You know, he could he could remember his dad, but he didn't have like core memories with his dad. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Um, for sure. Um, Being that young, you know, your your dad is, you know, your dad, your dad, but it's basically he's more like that's his father, right? Um. So the, the the two of them, they part of their bond that they they created was through like hiking and hunting, um, mostly like game birds because there's really not a lot of like animals worth shooting and eating on Crete because it's a small island. There's a lot of rodents and shit like that. Yeah, and then like wild goats, but it's a fucking goat. What's the? There's no sport in shooting goats unless you're like out in the Rockies and you're shooting those ones off the sides of fucking mountains and you gotta go chase them. True. But, you know, that's that's some man shit right there. But that's but. why they like, they like goat so much. Right. And goat's actually good. Uh, I like it. I mean, they fish. Right. And wow. goats are easy to maintain for as livestock animals because they don't yeah. eat a lot. They don't take up a lot of space. Um, so they're both mostly shooting like partridge and a bird called a capricelli, a capricelli, which from the looks of it, it looks like it's some kind of a pheasant. It's got like that kind of same build as like a pheasant. It's just different colored and kind of poofier, but okay. it, it looks like a pheasant to me. I don't know. Okay. I could be wrong. It could be a goddamn duck for all I know. Um, this is where Spiro would kind of, you know, he'd hone his skills on the stick, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, by that, I mean Alfonso's Browning Auto 5 semi-automatic shotgun. That's that's a fucking hot shotgun. Those are really nice. Yeah, um, for sure. Five shot, semi-automatic. Yeah. It's got like a fucking 36-inch barrel on it. It's a bird gun. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah. they're badass. It'll get the job done. Oh, for sure, for sure. Uh, so things are going pretty good. Family's in a good place financially. They, you know, they've got the bakery going. Um, Spiro's mm. just doing being a kid and shit. He's got a little brother to worry about. Um, all of that is going good up until 1939, when you know the world kind of goes to shit and World War II kicks off because some guy with one testicle and a tiny mustache decided he'd had enough of the Jews, and uh, you know. Yeah. Went into Poland about it, I guess. <laughs> well, I mean, he started off in, in Germany. I mean, the fucking the accursed land of Poland. <laughs> <laughs> but he st- but he had to start somewhere, and he started in in Germany, and then then it was like eh, this is not this is not enough. Let's go to Poland, the country that every fucking set of gods has forsaken. Poland, yeah, you know. Well, I mean, if you want to fight someone first, you have to go. You have, fight, you have to fight Poland. <laughs> Poland is the is the the, the fucking glass Joe of, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> of countries. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute! You don't get to fight anyone else first. Oh, you have to fight if, us. If you understood that reference, that means that you're probably uh, ready for a colonoscopy at this point. You know, yeah. uh, probably get that scheduled. Um, so September 1939, uh, World War II kind of became a reality for the people of Greece when their neighbor Italy joined up with the bad guys in 1940. The first ones to show up on Crete weren't Italians or Germans; they were Brits, because the Brits had a pretty they had a pretty good foothold in the Mediterranean. Yeah. Um, between like North Africa and then like Albania, they had a bunch of shit going on there. Um, and Albania and Greece border each other, which people may or may not know. Um, but the French also had a pretty good, um, pretty good setup in the Mediterranean too, because they own Morocco and um, I can't remember the other one, but um, but the, the the Brits' big foothold in that area was coming out of Egypt. So they could just hit the ocean, the sea, and fucking shoot right up into Greece. The French had the Foreign Legion there. Yeah, dude, the French Foreign Legion is still badass, though. Only problem is they got that goddamn FAMAS, which is dog shit. Who wants a who wants a thr- a, a fucking two shot burst uh, rifle with a th- fucking thirty three round magazine in it? What's the point of that? That's stupid. It's French. Yeah, never been fired, only been dropped <laughs> once. Dog shit. Anyway. <laughs> um. So the Brits show up there in uh, October of 1940, and they very quickly convince the Greek government to start massing forces, uh, like, in Crete, like, from the Cretan people. Uh, at this point, Spiro is 28 years old, and he signs up within days of the announcement saying, hey, we're going to start pulling people for service. So he didn't get drafted. He volunteered. Yeah. Um, he didn't having, get voluntold. No. Having, having some, uh, some combat experience of his own, his old man Alfonso, now 44, Signs up as well. Um, but with his experience in combat and stuff like that, and being older, they're like, we're not going to let you go fight. Yeah. You're going to train people. 
Yep. You're cool. Gonna, you're going to be in the rear of the gear. Yep. So he, he was he was running like their version of boot camp, like Greek boot camp. Yep. Sandal camp, whatever the fuck they had. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Spiro's unit trained for two months, and by January they'd been they had uh, been massing weapons and staying in fighting shape. You know, it's all that stuff. You just hear how, how <laughs> <laughs> after fighting wolves by themselves. Um, if he dies, so he dies. Here's the thing with Spiro's unit, though: is they specifically his unit of about fifty men may or may not have gotten some specialized training from the RAF. Put it at that. Um, but this is where shit gets gets a little weird. Okay. The unit that he's attached to was, quote, dissolved by the British Army. Ah. They were dispersed back into the wilds of Crete uh-huh. to train small resistance units. Okay. Okay. So we are creating the Greek resistance without having to let it happen organically like it was going to in France. Ah. Okay. Um, they were supplied with British weapons and, you know, just told... Keep these t- keep these close. And stay ready. So they had no faith in them that they were going to organically just you know happen. Oh, no, I I think this was intentionally like <clears throat> we're going to send you crazy motherfuckers out here, create your own little armies because and we just know be ready. You know we know you're a fighting stock. That uh, island fighting is notoriously hard. Yeah. Because you only have so many people. You only have the people that are there, where the attackers can bring more people. It's going to take them time, but they can bring more people. You can't, because yeah. you are cut off. I think the Cretes were... I, I don't know. I don't know my, my Greek, like, wartime stuff, like, all that better. But, like, I'm pretty sure they were pretty good fighters, if I, I'm not mistaken. The All of the Greeks were. <clears throat> like Wow, I mean... They weren't all Spartans, but they, they could all fucking fight. Yeah, I mean, Athenians were... They thought they were just... Kid fuckers. Boy fuckers. Yeah. <laughs> Politicians and boy fuckers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's from the uh, the documentary series 300. Yes. <laughs> um, but no, like, nobody was the Spartans. But, like, the, the, the Greeks could fight. Yeah. You know? I mean, and then the fucking Syrians or whatever showed up and Iranians, I don't know, Persians. Persians, Iranians, same Persians. things, I guess. Yeah. They showed up and they're like, hey. We can fight. We're better. gonna we're gonna fuck your shit. Yeah, you know. And yeah. well, well, they they the one guy that they sent into Sparta, he's like, uh, if we enter your lands, we'll kill every man, woman, and child here. And the the king of Sparta at the time's like, if, and he just left it at that, and walked away. That motherfucker probably just went, oh. <laughs> cold chills. He's like, I got to go. Like this is a bad place. Um, I mean, they didn't really conquer them either. Yeah, you know, it was like, eh, I mean. It's hard to conquer people that you kill every one of them, you know? It's true. Um, okay, so they were dissolved, get their weapons. Um, so this this whole, like, creating they a. Open the mountains, create little bands. <laughs> what they used here? Wolverines! So, like, creating a, a preemptive resistance force seems like it could backfire. <laughs> because, like, then if, if nothing happens, you have a bunch of heavily armed men that are also very well trained, that could go, I don't think we like the local government anymore. Uh-huh. Guess who this belongs to now? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, they, they could have ended badly. But it... it... Anyway. <laughs> um, so Spiro trained about 15 guys. I say guys because they range in the age from 16 to 40. Uh-huh. So they're not men. Not yeah. all of them. Um, he, uh, he, he gave them like his flavor of guerrilla warfare combat stuff. Um, his big thing was hide in plain sight. Okay. (laughs) This, this dude's fucking crazy. So he armed them with British weapons that they, that had been supplied to him. Um, notably about three dozen Sten guns and God only knows how many grenades. Um, and fields. No, only, they only gave him Stens. Really? Yeah. You're tight combat. You're in, you're in towns. That's true. You don't need bolt guns. You need, you know, fucking, (laughs) You need something small and automatic that you can hit these guys on a bicycle with and just take off. Um, but they, all the, this is the crazy, this part I love. Everything that was, like, all these weapons were delivered directly to the bakery in crates with false top, like, false bottoms on them. So they would line the bottom of these with, with guns. Then they put, a, a, like, a false floor in and fill the rest of the crate with baking supplies. Uh-huh. So he, they're still getting their baking supplies for the, you know for the bakery and then he's got all the fucking heaters underneath yeah so 
that pretty oh. it's a big brain move is what oh, that look. is they they threw an extra yeah <laughs> So for quite some time, he had a, a basement full of flour, sugar, yeast, grenades, loaded stick magazines, and excellent little submachine guns at the bakery. Um, and he had a cot down there. Yeah. Because as far as anybody else knew, he was still in the army. So he didn't go out during the day. He only went out after dark to do... He's Batman. He's doing goon shit. <laughs> We're going to go out and bark at the moon and kill Nazis. Um, He's Batman. Um, uh, so one of the things that I thought was, was pretty fucking cool is... Uh, I found about I found out about his personal <laughs> modified Sten that he carried. Oh, um, you've, you've seen the Sten before? Yeah, yeah. Like looks like a like a cocking gun with a fucking magazine sticking yeah. outside of it. <laughs> so if you look at it, there's only about four inches of barrel that sticks out past the receiver. Yeah, right. He chopped his down to less than an inch past the receiver. Okay, makes it shorter. Okay. Then he also took the stock like the shoulder stock off and fixed he he made this rig out of like an old like beretta revolver handle that he uh, that he fixed to the back of it so he's now got this like tiny little submachine gun that's only about 14 inches long total from nose to butt and he would sling it under his jacket and you couldn't see it if he didn't have a magazine in it because it sat tight and he had this old, nasty, fucking, like, greenish jacket. He was cosplaying as a hobo. Okay. <laughs> basically. Okay. Um, so this thing is fucking crazy. Like, So if he actually sw- could switch it around, move it under. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, dude. But all he had to do was load it and pull up. Yeah. Because he had it slung to himself. So he could, he could, if he had it loaded, he could just pull up with one hand and fire yeah. and drop it back into his coat and run off. True. You know? He's, he's doing some secret squirrel stuff, and I, I, I'm here for it. The early morning hours of May 20th, 1941, <clears throat> were opened by Yunker JU-52s flying over the village of uh, Ch- uh, Chania, and they're just shitting German paratroopers out the back of it. Um, German paratroopers, the Fallschirmjäger, not guys to fuck with. No. They are bad, bad dudes. Yeah. Um, and the best part is, they weren't SS, most of them. They were just Wehrmacht. They were just regular yeah. army, um, which means you don't have to immediately hate them. No. Because they were dudes out there fighting. Um, the SS can all burn in hell because they were the ones that actually knew what was going on. These were dudes that were like, oh, we're going to war? Okay. You know, and they'll, all right, we'll, we'll do it. You can't discount, though, the badassery of, of the SS, though. The Waffen SS. <sighs> yeah, but they were still assholes. It's true. They were. You know. But, I mean, they still were, like, badass. That'd be like saying, you know, like, like all of a sudden we all found out that the Navy SEALs are, like, eating babies and stuff. You're like, yeah, they're badass, but you, you kind of have to ignore the fact that they're eating babies. Well, I'm like, yeah, you know? ignore that. Exactly. I'm not saying that, you know, we have to ignore the fact that they were fucking going, eh, yeah, killing Jews, whatever. It's the, it's the Chris Benoit argument. Yeah. Yeah, he was great in ring, but he was a piece of shit. <laughs> you know? Um. So why are they being dropped here specifically is because most of the Kiwi forces are stationed just outside of town at an air base. Um, they didn't know that Spiro lived like in his band of like merry assholes lived in the next little town of Malame, which is where the actual where the airfield actually was. Like yeah. this is down on like a dirt road and you're there. That's that's the town he's in. <clears throat> <coughs> So as the invasion started, he gets a runner, like comes running up and fucking banging on the door of the bakery. His mother knows what's going on because she's kind of like, she has to know because he's living there, <laughs> you know. Besides a secret message down two baguettes, uh, a croissant, and uh, I, I need don't know. I need three I th- I need three euros and your special <laughs> tzatziki sauce, special tzatziki sauce. Yeah. Ah, yes, we'll go to the basement for that, you know. Um, ah, so the Germans are coming. <laughs> yes. So the the runner had orders directly from British High Command saying, do not openly attack the Germans. Wait, because they're, they're landing near your base. Let the Kiwis sort them out. If they come into your town, on the other hand, fuck them up. Like yeah. you guys have free range. Just don't actively go hunting for Germans. Yes. Because you're not equipped for it. 
because you're uh you're essentially a a light duty strike force you know you're you're doing you're you're doing guerrilla warfare shit yeah like this is where you should be setting up like trip lines and landmines and shit like that and getting ready he doesn't spoiler alert um he instead arms up with his sawed off sten and a canvas bag that he used to use to deliver bread um you know, you know bread pastry stuff like that to you know their customers they had a list obviously door to door and of course you know get your bread and, you know get your bread yeah, yeah, yeah um so he starts making his rounds like he had any other day because he had started going back out during the day he had grew out his mustache fucking shaggied himself all up looked like shit nobody really recognized him and he had been in this town for quite some time nobody really like like oh who the fuck this guy is maybe he kind of looks like spiro i don't know whatever they're all greek they all look the same you know Olive skin, arm hair, mustaches. Who the fuck knows? Yeah. You know, Greeks, Italians. It's all it's all Greek to me. Um, so he starts, you know, handing that bread to the regulars. Then he has to go back because he's got a special oh. batch for the Germans. Ah. Because they also delivered to the air base for breads and shit like that. So instead of bringing the cart that he usually did, he just like, it's a light delivery. I'll, I'll do it on foot. I'll, 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 I'll hand deliver it, you know. So he's walking down the road um, from Melamy to the airbase, um, and he gets a little. It gets kind of close to the airbase and decides to kind of peel off the road and do a little bit of recon, hang out in a little olive grove. And um, while he's there, a two-man German patrol just so happens to be walking through the olive grove, and they catch him. And um, you know, they come up, and they try to change him up, you know, try to chase him off. And he plays up like these guys are speaking Greek to him, but he plays up like he. Uh, what's the nice way to say it? I can't think of the nice way to say it. Um, he's acting like he might be a little slow, uh. you know, like he maybe got kicked in the head by a horse or something. He's like, I yeah. just come back, pick olives. Huh? Yeah, yeah. You know, so they're like, you know, they kind of fucking wrangle him up and they guide him out to the road and like get out of here you rascal and uh they turn and they're kind of like laughing and joking and um they shouldn't have turned around because he dove on top of both of them and just starts stabbing he had his knife out before he hit either one of them um the first one was likely dead before he hit the ground uh the other guy was not so lucky because spiro dabbed, yeah, stabbed him over a dozen times and then cut his throat so deeply that he almost took his head off as a trophy Mm. He he got in there. He got all up in his shit and yeah, yeah took him out. Um, so he collects his bag and then goes back to his hiding spot. Um, after you know, watering the olives. Uh, what makes olives grow? Blood, blood, blood. <laughs> <laughs> so he hid in another stand of trees until the next day, when a larger group of Germans made their way. From the base back towards town. Uh-huh. They'd been taking some pretty heavy casualties. Like, the Kiwis are fucking them up. Like, they lost, like, 160 men during this little skirmish with these guys. So these guys had been ordered to go back into town to try to gather food. Because these are paratroopers. They don't bring fucking food with them. No. You just jump out with all your shit. Yeah. And call it a day. Um, so as they're coming down the road, he emerges out of the darkness with his bag of breads. And um, this pile of Germans stop him. And bread. they're like, hey, what you got in the bag, buddy? And uh, it's like, I have bread. I have many, many breads. Would you like some breads? Um, so one of them kind of like fucking roughed him up a little bit. You know, he was not nice to him. And uh, basically was like, give me the fucking bag. Okay, whatever. So he says, I just want my money. That's fine. Take your money. He reaches into his bag and he grabs his little billfold, his little purse thing. It's got all this change in it for making change because, you know, people don't have charge accounts. You got to pay cash. Um, so they didn't think it was odd that he wanted his money. They did think it was a little weird and they were kind of puzzled as to why when he handed them the bag, he ran off the side of the road like a fucking psychopath. Found out a couple seconds later why he was running away. When all the grenades that were in the bag went off and cut the man holding the bag in half. Um, yeah. He was a crafty motherfucker. He had about a dozen grenades in there. All the pins are linked together with a real tight wire. Yeah. So all he had to do was pull one wire while he was in there <laughs> and run. 
Yeah. And he's just armed about a dozen grenades. Um, so obviously everybody that was in, oh, for another important detail, uh, anybody that had picked up the bag would not have known that there was grenades in it because they were all hidden in fucking rolls. Uh-huh. <laughs> so he hollowed out rolls, stuffed grenades into them. So you just, all you see is if you were even looking like fish line connecting all these rolls together. Okay. Um, by, by his account that he had given, given to somebody in the next 30 ish minutes or so, um, there'd been about 30 Germans that had accosted him and pilfered his bread. Um, the men in the immediate blast area were fucking shredded like sauerkraut. Um, the rest were kind of knocked down and wounded and that's a lot of grenades, you know? And then if you have people kind of tight in, they take a lot of the shrapnel. Other guys are just getting fucked up a little bit and they're, they're hurting. So there's just a, a, a pile of Germans writhing around the, on the ground, bleeding and wounded. Um, Spiro stepped out of the trees, opened his coat, removed his modded sten, and finished off somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 Germans with one 32 round magazine. Ammo's not not cheap. No, we're we're gonna be <laughs> we're gonna be not we're gonna be a little frugal with it. Yeah. Uh, so we're, I'm thinking a lot of like chest and headshots. Um. So he then runs back into town, knowing that obviously this is gonna draw some fucking attention, and turns out you know. When another crew of dudes got there, they find, you know, two and a half, de- two and a half dozen dead Germans kind of draws their attention as well. So the next wave of Germans made it into town about an hour after he did. Um, this one was about a hundred strong. There was, they sent, they sent some boys, uh, cause they're like, we've got some shit we need to handle here. Yeah. They walked the streets, you know, from, per- you know, going person to person, asking anybody if they had, you know, any information if anybody had seen anything. Yeah. Because you have to. Right. Um, and, of course, like the people in town don't have a fucking <laughs> blues clue as to what these guys are talking about. Um, then a, a man staggers up to a smaller group of about six Germans. He just stinks like stale wine and cigarettes. And uh, he's like, yeah, I, I saw a guy in a nasty old green coat running that way through town. Um, he left just before you guys got here. So he was headed east out of town. Streets are completely empty in this little one little spot. Um, the Germans passed him. They kind of you know shoved him to the ground. A couple of them kicked him. He's a fucking homeless guy. Who gives a shit? Um, this homeless drunk man rolls over, peels out his chopped up sten and just fucking hoses down all of these Germans with nine mil. Surprise! It was Spiro. <laughs> Surprise, motherfucker. Uh, Unfortunately, the luck of the Greeks is about to run out for him here, though. Um, gets his feet underneath him, reloads, and runs to the corner of a building trying to figure out his next move. Um, he was likely headed, most likely headed back to the bakery. Because uh-huh. he knows he can go there and lay low. You know, there's not basement access. It's in a fucking, it's under a, a trap door, under a carpet. Yeah. That, you know, his mom's fucking stool is on, so nobody's going to look there. So he's, he's going to try to find a, a way to lay low here. Um, as he cuts the corner, another group of Germans come from a side street and he looked down the street and saw them. And he actually saw another, he saw a woman pointing at him directly and he's like, fuck. So he tries to run off. Um, they eventually did catch him. They beat the absolute dog shit out of him, uh, dragged him to the town center. And, um, they, the, the Germans at this point in time have regrouped everybody that's still alive and start dragging people from all over town to the town center to show them what happens when you fight back. They're going to make an example here. Um, he was tied to a, they said a laundry pole. Okay. So I'm assuming like, yeah, you know, like a pole for like a, a like a, a, a laundry line for like yeah. drying your clothes and stuff. Um, line. Yeah. And yeah. And he was killed by firing squad. Um, they then threw his remains into a, a cart, dragged him down to the ocean and dumped him in the water and left him there. Um, Spiro Malekis was 28 years old when he died fighting German shitheads. Um, But keep in mind, over the course of about an hour and a half, he took 38 Nazis to hell with him. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's impressive. (laughs) Not bad. No. Not fucking bad at all. Um, I mean, he almost got away with it. He did. (laughs) 
If he it did. wasn't for that one meddling fucking lady. Yeah. She wouldn't fucking, you know, kept her nose out of it. One appointed at him. Yep. Went with the program. Fucking bitch. And the fucking craziest part about this story? None of this actually happened. I made this whole thing up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was like, I was looking at some badasses, and I was like, I bet I could trick him. <laughs> you probably would. It is a good one. Yeah. Good uh, matter of fact, uh, malekis is uh, the the Greek word for bullshit. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> uh, but like, the Battle of Gallipoli actually happened. The invasion yes. of Battle of Cre- Battle of Crete actually happened. You know, I was just having some fun. <laughs> <laughs> what a cocksucker! It's <laughs> uh, a good one. I couldn't get you with the fucking, uh, I've never gotten you with, uh, with a truth or scare, but faux badass <laughs> nailed him. Nice. Way to go. Uh, yeah. <sighs> Bravo. Bravo. I had such a hard time keeping it together as I'm reading it to him. Like he's going to catch some detail and go, that's fake. That's not real. I was like, no, nope, I think I got him. All right. <laughs> oh, hold on. It gets even better. Cause, uh. Touche, cocksucker. Hold on. No, no, no. We're not done yet because I, I even did something here. Uh, I was like, I got to have I gotta have proof of this guy, right? So I AI generated a Greek World War II soldier, and then I fucked the picture all up. Uh-huh. Well, yeah. So people are going to see that and go, wow, that guy's got a great mustache. And uh, turns out, guy's computer generated. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you can tell if you look real close because he's only got three fingers on each hand. AI does that. They tend to do three or six for some reason. Yeah. Yep. But, uh, yeah, that was... Uh... <laughs> what a that's, fucker. That was my manufactured badass. <laughs> oh. uh, huh. So now I guess I got to do a real one for my next, <laughs> next episode. <laughs> ah, I got you, motherfucker. <laughs> He pushes his microphone away. Uh, oh, man. I quit. I'm done. <laughs> the only two people that know that I did this are my wife and Seth. Now me. Now you, yeah. But, uh, yeah, because I was talking to Seth. I'm like, I think I'm going to fuck with Kevin. He goes, what do you mean? I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a made-up badass. I'm like, okay. So he's like, we're bouncing ideas back and forth. And I'm like, do a part of World War II that we haven't really talked about. This, that, the other. And he's like, like I like it. I like it. He goes, he's like, uh, just come up with a really good name. I'm like, hey, dude, fucking Spiro is a like, goddamn a great Greek name. And I was like, I'm going <coughs> to anybody that anybody that knows Greek when they hear the last name is going to go, wait a minute. That sounds weird because it is. But uh, I don't know enough Greek. So I don't either. I, uh, I went with it. I don't either. I mean, I knew it was, you know, I was like, oh, Malekis. OK, that's good fucking Greek. Maybe I should do an actual, like, actual Greek badass. Like a go-back-in-time Greek badass uh-huh. for the next one. Uh-huh. Just as a... I'm going to have my head... I'm going to fucking have my head on a pillow. I'm going like, <laughs> to fucking... You better, bitch, because uh, you never know when it's coming again. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, uh-huh. Well, you can tell Seth how old you got me. <laughs> oh, well, uh. well, that said, uh, fuck you all. I hope you guys enjoyed this as much as I did, because, like, my face hurts now, because I've been smiling for, so, like, as hard as I have been. Yeah, as soon as he went, yeah, the best part of it is uh, that this, this guy does, just doesn't exist. <laughs> I was like, I was kind of like, what? <laughs> you, he fucking what now? <laughs> what? You said what? Uh, Motherfucker. It means I'm good at it, though. It was good. It was good. I like it. Well, you research enough badasses, you know. Yeah. And then you yeah, just blindside you with something that you're not as familiar with from World War II. You know? It's true. Because if I had been like, oh, no, this guy was an 82nd Airborne and he dropped into Market Garden or something, you could have been like, eh, something don't feel right here. <laughs> you know, you do a fucking fake Greek and you're like, you don't think anything of it. You know, I could have named this guy fucking Oikos Activia and you would have been like, ah, it sounds like, like yogurt. And that's because those are both yogurts. But uh, <laughs> could have been named after him, whatever. I don't know. You know. <laughs> yeah. All right. Got you, bitch. 